So, hello everybody, thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, first of all, can you hear me? Is the volume fine? Okay, good. So in this talk, I will talk about PyPy and the PyPy JIT in particular. First, a few words about me. I've been a PyPy core developer for more than 10 years now. I'm also the author of some other open source uh, projects like PDB++, VMProf, and others. You can find me on Twitter. And uh, before I forget, uh, I will show you some uh, demo code uh, in this presentation. You can find uh, the source code at, uh, at this link. So if you, if you want to try it by yourself. So let's start talking about PyPy. Usually when, uh, when we are at conferences and talk with people about PyPy, the, the general question is, how fast is it? And uh, actually, the answer is, it depends. There is no uh, single answer to this question, because it really depends on the kind of code you are running. And uh, as we will see, of, it will also depend on how this code is written. If you go to speed.pypy.org, you, you can see uh, the benchmarks we, we run uh, every night. And there is also this nice uh, graph which is summarized. As you see, we, we, um, we compute that in, on average we are seven, ti seven times faster than CPython. But uh, of course, this, this number doesn't mean anything. It really depends on your code. And as I will show in this presentation, the cool thing is that for, because of the way the JIT works, it, uh, it is able to remove a lot of the overhead of, of abstractions in your code, which means that the better the code you write, the, the greater is the speed up against CPython. So w what does it mean to write good code? Well, first of all, it, means to be, it needs to be correct and it works, yes. Uh, and then it's, it's nice to have code which is readable, which is easy to maintain, um, which has a nice API, if you are writing a library, designing the API is very important because this is how the user will, uh, will use your library and if the API is uh, easy to use, well, your library is much better than, than the alternative. And of course, it would be nice if our code is fast and in particular it would be nice if uh, by writing a nice code which is uh, readable and maintainable and et cetera, we, we don't impact the speed of the code. Mm -hmm. Usually well, one way of writing good code is to, to make a good, good use of abstractions. Like for example, it's something that we, we all do when, when writing code. We, we try to factor out common pieces of logic into functions, then we, we group common pieces of uh, data and uh, behaviors into classes. We use inheritance to, to share behavior and et cetera. And uh, yes, this makes the code better and more readable and et cetera. But sometimes this, uh, this, this style of writing code has a cost, especially on CPython, as we will see briefly. In, uh, in the following, I will show you a demo, and, uh, and I will show you various way, ways to write the very same piece of logic, and, uh, and we will compare the performance of CPython and PyPy in, in the various versions of the code. Uh, the, the demo is uh, about some image processing. We are running a Sobel filter on, um, on some video or uh, stream from a webcam to with the result to, uh, to compute some uh, edge, de edge detection of, of the image. I, this is just a copy and paste from Wiki Wikipedia. I am not really a, a computer vision guy, so I don't really know how it works. I just copied and pasted it from somewhere else, basically. So how do we represent an image? Uh, in, this, uh, in this demo, we start by representing an image in a very simple way. Uh, an image is consi it consists of a variable which contains the width, the height of the image, and an array, which is our data. Uh, we are talking about a grayscale image, so uh, each pixel is represented by one byte from zero to 255. And uh, so yes, we have this linear array, and we can uh, index a single pixel at position x and y by 
by doing this as a simple calculation. So, we, we go to Wikipedia, we, we see what is the math behind it. We, we just write it as a simple uh, loop in which we do everything in line, basically. So, you can see that here we have our image, which consists of three, three variables. We, comp we, we create the, the output image, and for each pixel, we do the calculation. You can see that, for example, to address each pixel, I do here the, the computation manually every time. And, uh, and well, basically, this works. I, I can show you the demo, like, this is the program run, running on PyPy, and you see that it kind of fast, it works on real time. You see the, the number of FPS, it's, it's a bit slow because it's the frame rate of my webcam. If you, if you uh, use a video, a, a video file, it's much faster. For comparison, let's try with CPython. Yes. <laughs> it, it's not even too bad. I mean, one, more than one frame per second, yes. Uh, from now on, uh, I, I, will, uh, I, I will avoid showing you the, the um, real-time image. I have also have a quick program to benchmark the various versions of the code. So this is CPython, which does almost five uh, frames per second, and this is PyPy, which does more than 270. So yes, this is very good. PyPy is... Uh, some large number faster than CPython. Uh, here there are, there are the, the histograms, but as you see, the way axis is at a different scale because I'll say, well, the, the CPython would be too, too um, uh, little to, to be seen. But yes, I mean, the version, yeah, this works, it's fine, but it, it, it's really bad code because, uh, for example, here we have the logic for computing the index for a single pixel, which is repeated again and again, and it's, it's very bad. So what we do, we start to make it a bit nicer, and we write some functions to get a pixel and to set a pixel. So our code becomes a bit nicer. So you see that we can call this function to get the pixel. What happens if we run it? Let's try on CPython. It's computing only 10 frames on CPython because if computed all the frames of the video file, it would take forever. So you see, it's like half the speed of before. Let's try on PyPy. Ooh, almost the same speed as before. Uh, actually, the number really varies a lot because, of course, it is a laptop with hyper-threading and the uh, temperature of the CPU, so the, take it with a grain of salt. But yes, in general, basically this version is the same speed as uh, before. And uh, yes, so we start see. We, we wrote code which is nicer and better, and PyPy is already faster than, than CPython, much faster than CPython than before. So we, we do more. We start to represent an image by using a, a, a real class, an actual uh, instance, so we, we have this class, we, um, we save the, the width and the height and the, and the data array, and we have this get item and set item uh, special methods, which computes the actual, um, uh, the actual index in the, in the array for us. So now it, it becomes much nicer to write. I don't have a slide here, but... I oh, know, I think it's version two. Yes. You can see here that we can index directly the pixel inside the image. And uh, as you can guess, we run it on CPython.
and it's again slower than before, and we run it on PyPy, and guess what? But still the same speed. So you start, you start to see a pattern here because uh, we introduce more and more layers of abstractions, and on every layer of abstraction introduces an overhead on CPython, and, uh, and no overhead at all on, uh, on PyPy. And uh, this is because, as we will see later, the JIT has logic to remove this kind of overhead. And, uh, and so, as, as, as I said, the better the code we write, the faster it becomes. So now we, 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 we want to, get to, to, to make it even fancier, and uh, we start to represent a point inside uh, the image, like with a, with a class, uh, and uh, we can add a point to, to another so that we can compute offsets for, uh, for the point, and also we want to abstract the, the notion of how to iterate over the image into, into a nice method, because, for example, in this version of the code, we, we run the filter, the, 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 the kernel of, of the computation, on all pixels of the image apart the border, because that's a, we don't have the neighbor pixel to, to consider. And, uh, but there are various possibilities and, uh, other, and other ways to handle the edge cases. So we didn't want to put them in the, uh, in the for loops. Like we see in the for loop here, we have this range from 1 to h minus 1, which b basically means to avoid the border, but it's much nicer to, to put it in the... Uh, uh, in a method, and as, as we see here, we basically we, we return an iterator with, which iterates over all the pixel of the image by, by computing them using uh, iterators of, dot product. And so basically we can start to write our code in a slightly different way. For example, here uh, you see that we iterate over all the pixel. We are only one loop instead of the two nested loop of before, and uh, to compute the neighbors, we really can, can use a, a nicer syntax because we, we, can, we, we can just say, uh, take the point which is one pixel right and uh, uh, one pixel uh, to the bottom and etc. And, yes, i show you. On CPython, this starts to become very, very slow, now we have and even drink some water while we wait. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should drink the whole bottle. I don't know what's happening. Yes. So if we, we, remember, we started from on CPython to almost five frames per second, and now it's like 10 times lower or something. And guess what? Oops, sorry. Version three. Yes. Oh, no, this is this is low. Oh, well. Ah, yes. <laughs> I think I think this is my laptop, which is getting uh, hotter. But yes. <laughs> no, actually, actually, there is a bit of penalty here. Uh, if you if you run it a lot of times, you see that you get a slightly uh, smaller percentage of uh, number of FPS. Probably the JIT introduces a bit of overhead, but it's really tiny compared to the overhead uh, which is introduced by CPython. Uh, I didn't look at the exact code produced by the JIT uh, to see where this, this, uh, this fraction of the performance is lost, but it might be that, for example, that here Hyter Tools product actually creates a new object which is ne needs to be collected by the GC, so we had a bit of pressure or something like this. I don't know, but really, it's negligible. In com confronting to, to comparing it to C Python, so we get we, we want to go even fancier. Is this code big enough to be read? I hope so. So basically, what we did so far is to do a, a manual uh, computation. We have this matrix, which is shown here, with two, two matrices. And uh, the, the idea of, of a filter is that uh, for each pixel in the image, we want to 
to compute it, uh, to compute the multiplication of, of this matrix, and here, we basically, we, we do it uh, manually, but it would be much nicer to, uh, to abstract also this, uh, this computation, to, to, to write it in, in a uh, saner way. So here we have uh, our class, which, is the, which represents the kernel, and we, when we, we, we give it the, the matrix, like this is a copy and paste from the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page, and when we call this object passing an image and a point, it, uh, uh, it computes the multiplication of the, of, of the matrix for the point. And uh, yes, I mean, this started to, 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 to the code now starts to be, uh, to be really nicer than before because, for example, if we want to, to try another filter or uh, something else, we can just edit the values in the matrix and, uh, and be happy. And um, so let's try it again on CPython. Yes, now I really can. Yes, basically, I, I mean, the, 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 the talk is scheduled to, be, to, to last one hour, but most of the time is spent in waiting for CPython to do its things. Is it ready yet? Yes. Even slower, not much slower than before. So now, guess what happens with PyPy? Any guess? Nope. Now it's much slower, like t 10 times lower than before. I mean, it's still faster. I mean, it's still much faster than CPython. If you, if you start from this version of the code, you, you, you run it on, uh, uh, on CPython and PyPy, you see that it's 76 times faster and you're happy and you, see, you, you go to conferences to say that PyPy uh, is really nice and uh, it works, but actually, I mean, here we are running much, much slower than we could because, I, I mean, the, the, the title of the talk is abstraction for free. This is not free at all. So yes, we concluded PyPy sucks and I'm a liar and uh, please go home. Well, of course not. Yes, basically I will show you later why, why this happens, but uh, the point is that the PyPy JIT works by uh, computing loops uh, detecting loops and compiling uh, uh, assembly version of th these loops. But here, normally, when we have this kind of code, we have one loop, which is the for loop, and, uh, uh, and the JIT sees a list of operations, so it emits JIT co uh, assembly code for it, and it, this is run uh, in a linear way, and it's, well, the CPU can do it very fast. But here, we, we, we start to have a, a lot of uh, nested loops, and basically, uh, it means that if you look at the generated code, you, when you are in, in the iterating over all the pixel, then you, you do what the equivalent of a function call to, to the other uh, loop which has been uh, compiled by the JIT. And, uh, this kind of operation is uh, slowish on PyPy. As long as you stay in one loop, it's very fast. If you jump between loops, it's still fast. I mean, it's still 70 times faster than CPython, but it's not as fast as if you stay in a loop. So um, one, one, one possibility to, uh, to solve this, uh, this issue is to unroll manually the loop. So basically here you see that we have this function which creates a kernel function from the matrix I pass. And uh, I'm using this uh, PyPy tools module which I wrote and it's available on PyPyI. And it doesn't nothing uh, special, it's just a nice wrapper to generate code on the fly. And you see I am generating a function which I call apply which takes an image and a point and 
I manually unroll uh, the, 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 the two nested loops here, and for each combination of J and I, I, I accumulate the, the value of, uh, of the computation in this, uh, in this special variable, which I then return. And then with this nice library I wrote, uh, uh, you, you can ask, ask it to compile it. Co co compiling this code is really uh, done by running exec on the string, nothing fancy. And then I, I return it. Basically, this gen if, if we pass this kernel, GX, it generates this kind of code, which, is, which you see is very, very um, similar to the, to the code uh, I showed you earlier, which I wrote manually, but now it's much nicer because the API of my, of my library looks, still looks like this. I, uh, I create uh, a kernel and it automatically gives me the, the, nice, the nice fast function. So let's try it again. I don't even try on CPython because you, you can guess now that it's utterly slow. And yes, we are fast again. Again okay, here, now I, I, I'm, I'm getting less FPS because probably it's really getting hotter, but, and, but I, trust me, earlier I got a higher result. So this is the, uh, the, final, the final graph, and we see that PyPy is again 400 times faster, I mean 400 times faster than CPython, I repeat. So what, what did we learn so far is that on CPython, every time you try to, to be nicer, well, you pay a cost. Because uh, Python is a dynamic language, and uh, every time you call a function, it has to do a dictionary lookup in the global namespace, and every time you call a method on the class, it has to uh, look up the method in the dictionary of the class, or of the instance if it has, and, uh, and every time you, you multiply two numbers, it has to create a temporary uh, value and this kind of overhead. On PyPy, we saw that the abstractions are, are almost free. Yes, there are a bit of overhead from the first to the, to the last uh, version, but it's not much, and it's, it's something that you can pay uh, quite easily, but uh, if if the if what you gain is uh, much nicer code. So in the in the second part of um, of this talk, I want to give you a very rough uh, idea of how PyPy is able to to do this kind of magic and uh, and optimization. So. We, 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 we will see uh, some uh, example of code and see what the, the JIT produces. And, uh, but I warn you, this is not a detailed uh, explanation and this is not even a completely correct explanation. I try to, to simplify things because I think it's um, easier to understand. If you, if you are interested in a deeper and more detailed explanation and even a more correct one, uh, I gave a, a talk at some EuroPython ago, I think it was 2013 or something, and uh, you, can, you can look at the slides or, uh, uh, or the video of the talk and uh, well, look at it. So let's start from a very simple, uh, um, from a very simple uh, um, piece of code. We have this... Uh, this function which computes this, the sum of n numbers and, uh, and it's, well, it's just a while loop. When, uh, when you run it on uh, PyPy, what happens is that at some point PyPy recognizes that we are uh, running a loop, so we are running the, the same code again and again, and after a certain number of iterations, the JIT kicks in and uh, compiles the code of this loop. And what, what produces is something like this, this is pseudocode, but I think it, uh, you, you should uh, understand more or less what's going on. The first thing to notice is that we are compiling only the loop. 
uh, you see that there is no uh, no code for uh, for the two lines before the loop and for the line after the loop. Uh, we are uh, running only the loop, and uh, the loops in PyPy are always infinite loops. And uh, the way you exit the loop is to f is by failing a guard. What is a guard? Uh, in this uh, in this pseudo code, I uh, wrote the guard uh, as assert. Basically, in the in the JIT uh, in the JIT code, we insert uh, some checks here and there to ensure that uh, the preconditions we we assume they are still uh, are still true. So, for example, if if we pass uh, an integer to compute, we have uh, total and i and then which are all integer variables, and we can produce a specialized version for uh, for this code, which is able to do uh, an integer addition here. If we pass a float, well, this. Um, the assembly code is no longer the same because at the CPU level, we have different instructions for adding to flows or to integers. So we, we, the JIT will, will have to generate another, another one. And here you, you see that the guard is that we are checking that the variable we passed is actually an integer. And also, because of the semantics of Python, Every time we do a, a, an addition of two integers, we, we need to check for overflow because in this case, we, we need to switch to uh, longs. I'm talking about Python 2.7 here. Um, so you see that every time we do this uh, integer addition, we also need to check for, uh, for overflow. This is also a guard. So what happens is that in the normal case, you have a very fast loop which, uh, which sums uh, integers. Uh, these are really low-level integers. Like if, if you write the program in C, it's, it's not like a fancy structure which is malloced in memory. It's really an int a a variable which is, which is stored in a CPU register. And uh, as long as there is no overflow, everything goes fast. Uh, also, you see that the condition of, of the loop has, be, has been... Uh, um, Turn into a, into another guard here, so it means that at some point this guard will fail, and this is how we exit the loop. And then there is a, a, a lot of complicated code in PyPy which switch back from the jitted code to the old interpreted one. So let's let's, let's see what happens uh, uh, if, when when things are more complicated. So suppose you have an if inside your uh, loop. And in this case, uh, every other iteration you do one operation, and every other iteration you do the other operation. What happens is that at some point we are on the loop, and after a certain number of iterations, the JIT kicks in and compile a version of the loop. But uh, when the JIT kicks in, it sees only the iteration which is being executed now. So we only see one path through the code, not the other. So, for example, in, uh, in this particular case, we, um, we only saw the then branch of the if, but not the else. You see that here in the code which has been generated by the JIT, it's, it's more or less like the one before, but we are asserting that we are in this branch of the code. The other is not considered at all. So what happens is that the next time you do the iteration, this guard will fail, and you get out of the jitted code. And uh, there is special logic that checks that if a guard is failing very often, then probably it means that uh, it's worth compiling it again, uh, as well. So what happens is that after a certain number of guard failures, the JIT compiles what we call a bridge, and uh, it basically it attaches another piece of assembly code to the to the code which was already in memory. We really go in memory and change the operation, uh, the, the CPU instruction from being a, a jump to the JIT fallback code to a jump to the newly compiled code. So in this pseudo code, what, what happens is that we have two different bridges. One is the main loop and the other is the newly compiled bridge. But you see that one, one important thing is that we never do a merge after. So for example, this instruction, which is um, 
which is done after the if, here it's replicated both in the, in the main loop and in the bridge. And uh, this basically is one of the reasons why on PyPy you need to take warm up into account when you are, when you are measuring uh, your, um, your performance because if the program runs um, for uh, not enough time, you spend too much time compiling the various loops and bridges. After uh, a while, not, not much, I mean, you see that on, on, this, uh, on my example, uh, uh, a couple of seconds were more than enough for warming up. Uh, everything has been stabilized usually, and uh, all, all the hot path of the code has been compiled by the JIT, and you're happy. So go back to our example. If you remember, the first version, improved version of the code was, uh, was the one which put the logic to compute the index inside the array into functions. And we saw that PyPy did not uh, suffer from performance. This is done because uh, for the way the JIT is, uh, is written, uh, inlining happens automatically. So here we have the same function as before, but this time uh, the addition is, store, is done uh, inside this function. And what happens is that the JIT doesn't care and they just see that inside the function we do the addition and so we put the low level instruction directly here. But, but well, Python is a dynamic language and uh, if I just give you this code and, uh, and try, uh, ask you to execute it, well, you cannot be sure that Fn is always the same because it might be that someone monkey paged my module and uh, Fn is something different. Or it might even be that I manually change the under under code attribute of the function and, uh, and make it uh, executing something completely different. And uh, so the, the function is still the same, but the, the behavior is different. And there are a lot of crazy things that can happen in Python. And this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to optimize. And the PyPy approach is to insert a lot of guards for each of these conditions. And so, for example, here we, we check that the globals dictionary, which is the dictionary where the fn lives, is still at the same version as before. The version is just an internal number that we, we, we use to keep track of the state of the dictionary. Every time we, we modify the dictionary, we increment the version. So, if nobody touched the dictionary of a module, which, you sh which doesn't happen often um, after the initialization and importing, well, this guard will never fail and, uh, and uh, it will work fast. And uh, the same thing for the under under code of the function. But also note that we are smart enough that we put all these guards outside the loop because the JIT has a knowledge of what's going on, and it knows that by executing this few operation, we cannot change the globals, and we cannot change the FN code attribute. So basically, we, we move the, the guards out of the loop, which means that when you enter it, it's, it does a, a couple of quick checks at the beginning, and then in the, in the inner loop, which is where, where the time is spent, there are no guards, or few of them. And now, now you, 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 sti you, see, you start to see why the version in which we had the two different loops compiled was slower, because we need to do these checks again and again every time we enter a compiled loop function. Uh, the same for classes. So for example, here we have the class point, which, which has two attributes and I can compute the distance from the center by, using, by calling this uh, function from the math module, and uh, suppose I have a list of points, I want to compute the total distance. And here I, I insert more and more guards because in Python a lot of things can change, uh, really. So here, to make sure that the code inside p.distance is really this one, I need to check that the global dictionary didn't change, uh, that uh, the, the dictionary of the math module didn't change, uh, that the dictionary of the point class didn't, didn't change, and that, the, that the, the, this function still points to the same global as before, 
because it's, it's doing a global lookup of, this, of the math uh, symbol and, uh, and uh, other things. So basically, after all these guards, we are sure that the code here inside is this one. So you see that, again, in the loop, we can insert uh, and inline the, the, um, the call to, to this function which is written in C, or in NerPython in the case of PyPy, but yes. So I think that now you, you, you start to see a pattern. Uh, basically, every time you have uh, a, uh, some dynamic behavior of Python which makes it hard to optimize, well, PyPy tries to, um, to reduce the dynamicity by, uh, by putting guards and hoping that the situation doesn't change, which, which, will almost every, uh, which is very often it's true because, for example, modifying uh, the fn, uh, the code attribute of a function never happens. But if it does, PyPy is still correct. It means that the guard fails, so we, we cannot use the jitted code. We are slow, but we are correct, which is important. And finally, one of the most important, uh, one of the most important optimization of the JIT is the one about virtuals, and this is where, where you really win a lot. Because, for example, suppose here I rewrote, I rewrote it in a different way, and at each iteration of the loop, I create a new point object, and then I compute the distance. I mean, I could call math.hypot directly, but in this case, for show, for show you this optimization, it was, I had to do this. What happens on CPython? It means that at every iteration of the loop, I create the new object, so I do, I, I do a call to malloc, and then uh, I call the init, and I set the x variable to i, the y variable to i plus one, then I call the distance, so I do another method lookup and et cetera, and you see why you are paying a lot of performance. What happens in PyPy is that PyPy recognizes that here, at every loop, we are creating this point object, we are calling a method on it, but we are immediately destroying it. It never escapes the loop. So we, the, the JIT is uh, smart enough to uh, explode the, the structure of the point object into two local variables. So instead of creating a, a, an object in memory and storing x and y in memory, it stores them, for example, in some uh, CPU register. So here you see that instead of having a, an object p and a p.x uh, field, we just have a px local variable, and the same for the py. And, um, and so now we can, uh, again, inline the call to p.distance. Note that we have less guards than before, because now, uh, we, we know that, um, uh, that P is of type point because we just created it. Well, we didn't create it because we virtualized, but from the abstract point of view, it's, it's this, this kind of class. So we, we can even uh, uh, reduce the number of guards. And, uh, and basically, that's it. Uh, and that's why... Um, why PyPy can be so fast and uh, basically by applying this kind of optimization, you, you can see that in all the version of the code of the demo I showed you, um, we removed all the, all the overhead of the abstraction to get more or less the same performance as before. It's, it's possible that the, the, the the, the bit of slowdown you saw, it's because of these extra guards, for example. You, you, you pay a bit of for the dynamicity of Python, but not much. And uh, there is another thing I wanted to show you, and it's related to this guard I showed you before, because, for example, when we do an inlined call, well, basically the JIT has to check that this code object is, uh, uh, is still the same uh, than, than it as seen before, but let's go here. In this, the, the, this is the version five. Um, here we are creating dynamically 
a new function. We, so me, and so it means that we are creating a new code object again and again. And in this particular case, PyPy is fast because this function is created uh, at the global level. So we create only once, and uh, the JIT always sees the very same. But if I modify the code, actually, I didn't try this, and I hope that my theory is correct. This is the, but I'm quite sure it is. So if we move this call from outside to inside, something like this, then it means that every time the, um, the JIT will, will see a new code object, so it cannot apply the same optimization as before, and so probably it will be very slow. Yes. So uh, this is an important thing to know because uh, I have seen it uh, in uh, real life code, w which maybe creates uh, uh, classes uh, inside functions or uh, um, or things like this. And uh, in C Python, th this does not change much. But from the po point of view of PyPy, it changes a lot because even if it's the same function. It has a different identity, so the JIT cannot, cannot uh, be sure that the behavior is the same, and it has to recompile the same code uh, again and again. So basically, that's it. Uh, there, are, there are more PyPy events at here at EuroPython. Tomorrow, we will run the PyPy help desk, so you can come and ask us questions. Uh, on uh, Friday, there is uh, a talk about the general status of PyPy, which will be done by Armin, which is, who is here. And uh, I don't know who, what he's talking about uh, in particular, but yes. If you are interested in PyPy, you might be interested in coming. Or we, you could just stop us here during the conference and ask us questions because, well, I'm happy to answer all the questions you have if you want. So if you have questions now, um, First of all, let's thank our speaker for the presentation. Thank you. And we have time for questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, wanted to ask, why do you need to check the version number? Is it not enough just to check that the code pointer is still the same? Sir, could you speak slower because I didn't understand. Why is it not enough to check that the code pointer stayed the same? Why do you also need to check the version number of the globals? Why is it not enough to check the, glob the, the version number? Why is it not enough to check that the code pointer stayed the same? Because the dictionary might change. Maybe the, the, the same dictionary, but the content of the dictionary has changed. If I, or, or I didn't understand yeah, the question. Yeah, it was uh, slide 31, if I remember correctly. Well, but, but, but it would still uh, have the uh, same code pointer, because we're also checking the code pointer. Sorry. Yes. Um, both need to be checked because you can you can change you can hack your Python interpreter by changing what the name fn refers to, but you can also keep the same name fn but changing what fn dot code refers to ah, in maybe. Python. So so we need to check both. I don't know if this answers your question, but let's try. So now foo is free, but if I can do this. So this is kind of dynamicity of Python, which gets in the way when you want to optimize. But
Ah, I see. Uh, well, for example, uh, you could have this, the two function with the same code object but the different globals, so it's easier to check for, uh, uh, for the uh, mm, function object. But, but may, or maybe you have uh, a global lookup of a constant, uh, and then you, you want to, to check for uh, um, well that, 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 that the constant is still the same, basically. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about the benchmarks you showed earlier. Um, I think it's kind of an unfair comparison because most C Python developers would not represent an image as a list of lists or import array. A sane developer in C Python would go straight to NumPy for this. So I was wondering if you had um, benchmarks or comparisons against NumPy, and uh, how does PyPy compare in this case? Yeah, yeah, I didn't try. I, I mean, yes, this was not the point of the talk. Yeah, I, I, I know that if you write C Python, you probably can be much faster by using NumPy or some specialized library, but. Sometimes you just need to write your Python code, and uh, which is not in some library, so it's useful to know that what you pay and what you don't pay. Uh, it was just an easy example to to show, basically. Hey, um, going back to slide 31, I think it was. Um, you're assuming essentially that you're running single-threaded there. How do you cope with the world changing asynchronously? So somebody could, in another thread, change one of the built-ins. I, I mean, that would be an insane thing to do. Uh, what happens with, with threads? Uh, so you're, you've got a, your loop. Do you periodically check that the state of the world hasn't changed? Or? Mm, I don't, don't know. Armin, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what occurs with, if you have, if you have a small enough loop, then the loop can be written in such a way that you know that it's not going to release a gil. So as long as gil is not released, then you use the fast path. And, and for the case where you call something and maybe the gil has been released, and then, well, then after, after the call returns, you need to, to do the, the, uh, the checks again. Hi. Um, when you went from uh, version 4 to version 5, uh, that sort of optimization, how do we, in our, if we run our own code on PyPy or something, and how do we find out that that's the sort of optimization we should be looking for? How difficult is it to find out? Mm, sorry, what, the question is how did I find what? So if we, if we run our own code on, on, on the PyPy, and it is kind of not very fast for some reason, for a similar reason. How do we find out on our own code that that's the sort of area we have to explore? Uh, to, to well, actually, I, I, I knew because I know how it works. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, what, what happens in real life uh, is that uh, you, you have this program and you, you see that it's slow or not fast enough. So what I usually do is first to profile, like for example using VMProf to see uh, where, where we spend most of the code. Then there is a tool uh, to look at the co um, code produced by the JIT. And uh, if you know for, uh, what, what, what are the optimization which you expect to be done, and you see that one optimization is not applied, it doesn't apply, then you, you, you have a hint of what's going on. For example, a lot of time happens that you expect an object to be virtual, like this, this kind of things. When I write code with PyPy in mind, I of, uh, often I, I, I know that the object I'm creating is temporary, so it will be virtualized. But sometimes I look at the trace and I see that it's not, because maybe it's passed to some function which was not compiled by the JIT or uh, other things, and, uh, and this kills the performance. So uh, if you uh, rewrite the code by uh, removing the, the line of code which forces the object, it becomes virtual again and, uh, and it's much faster. So, yes, uh, unfortunately there is no easy, uh, easy to use tool to, to detect this, uh, uh, this sc scenarios. You have to know basically what are the optimization that you expect, and if you see that some is not applied, well then you try to, to understand why. And that's why this kind of talk is useful, I think, because you start to, uh, to, to get an idea of what you can expect and cannot expect from the JIT, basically. 
Did I answer your question? One more in back. Uh, are there any plans to remove the gill from PyPy? <laughs> was it a question? Uh, are there any plans to remove the gill from PyPy? The author of PyPy? Plans to remove the gill from PyPy, the global interpreter lock. Yes. Ah, oh, so, uh, okay, then I understood a completely different question, yes. Uh, yes, there is, a, there is an ongoing branch, but I don't know much about it, uh, and uh, probably you should come to the uh, Friday talk to, to, <laughs> to know more. Hello. Um, you had some guards about asserting that an internet doesn't overflow. But uh, I don't think you can guarantee this unless you can solve the halting problem. So if the guard fails during the loop, does it, does it just revert to plain Python code, or what happens then? So, the, so the, the, the question is, what happens when a guard fails? Yes, inside the loop, there was a assert that integer doesn't well, overflow. Yes, basically. But you can't know this ahead of time, so. Well, basically, what happens is that we exit the, the jitter code, and uh, we, we have a special piece of code which uh, um, try to recover the, sta the, 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 the state of the computation, and we go back to the interpreter. So failing a guard is expensive, but most of the guard never fails, basically, or fails very rarely. Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, in your abstract, you mentioned that you're going to compare how using PyPy well compares to using other popular optimization methods like Cython. Can you shed some light on that? Yes, actually, I, 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 I'm sorry about this because uh, when I wrote the talk proposal, it was uh, months ago, and then when I prepared the talk, I, I forgot how <laughs> I wrote about this, uh, <laughs> this stuff, and so I didn't insert it in the, in the talk. And, uh, but yes, I have a, 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 a real-world experience of it because I wrote a library, which is Cup and Pie, about, uh, uh, which is about... Um, uh, parsing uh, cap and proto in, uh, in Python. Cap and proto is a binary protocol. And uh, the goal of, the, of this library is to be fast both on CPython and PyPy. And it was hard because, uh, as you saw, the two um, interpreters have very different performance characteristics. So what I ended up doing was to write uh, pure Python code, which was very fast on uh, PyPy, but then I annotated it externally with uh, Cython annotations, so basically, on CPython, I compile the pure Python code into Cython code, which is uh, a bit faster. And uh, on, uh, on PyPy, I, I just run the pure Python uh, uh, code, which is much, much better. In general, when you are running code on PyPy, if you have to choose whether to run pure Python code or the same code written in C, pure Python is faster, because the JIT has more knowledge about what's going on. And, uh, and there, are, there have been a couple of places in which I could not find a, a version of the code which was fast on both implementation, so I had to write two different versions, one for PyPy and one for CPython, but yes. Hey, uh, so in this example, it's pretty Sorry, well, small. Uh, okay. Um, how well does it work on sort of real life complex code when a lot of um, let's say in each trace, a lot of levels are traversed, a lot of functions are called like 10 functions deep. Do you have a rule of thumb how far it works? I, I, I don't have a, a, a precise answer, of, of course, because it really depends on the kind of code. But I, I have seen a real life code in which PyPy is 10 times faster than CPython. But sometimes it happens that you, you start from an existing, existing piece of code, and you try PyPy and it's lower, and then you look at the traces, for example, what, this is what I did in, uh, at some point, and, um, and I, I saw that something that I expected it to be optimized was not, and uh, by 
um, tweaking a couple of lines of code, I, I manage it, I manage it the code to make the code ten times faster or something like this. In this particular case, I'm talking about the problem was that uh, there was a dictionary in which the user mixed the Unicode and string keys, and uh, which is fine in Python, but in PyPy we have a special optimization that if you have a dictionary with, with whose whose keys are only strings or only Unicode, you get a specialized implementation. But if you mix them, you get the non-specialized lower implementation. So in this particular case, by switching to using a, a, an homogeneous type of, for the key, I, I got it much faster. But yes, that, that, that I don't have any magic uh, uh, rule to, uh, to make a generic piece of code faster. Hi. Uh, what developments can we expect for the JIT in the future? Can you make it, for example, more intelligent to handle the, the example you showed at the end, where you move the code around to handle that better? Uh, sorry. The question is, uh, what, is uh, what, do I, what do I expect for the JIT in, yeah, what, in the what, future? What uh, new developments you can implement there and what we can expect in the future? So, so, sorry, I didn't understand. <laughs> Maybe yes. Okay, try again. Uh, what developments can we expect for the JIT in the future? Can you make it more intelligent so that it handles your, your last example, for example, better? Yes, I, I think that nowadays the JIT is, uh, is quite kind of mature, so uh, we, we already need all the um, easy things to do to make it uh, faster, but uh, there are always new ideas on uh, how to make a particular case faster and uh, optimizing uh, uh, one particular uh, behavior or something. Uh, I don't think we have any magic uh, idea in mind right now, but uh, we are keeping adding new, new, new features, basically. And it's very nice because every time you add a new optimization, uh, you you unlock other optimization because I didn't show it, but it, it, it's, it's, you can see it in my other deeper talk. Uh, the optimization of the JIT, are, uh, they, they really work um, well together because sometimes an optimization, like you make a, something virtual, then uh, produces some code which is handled very well by another optimization. So at the end, uh, a lot of uh, operations are removed or uh, simplified. So, basically, so maybe if we uh, add uh, some new optimization to remove a particular piece of overhead, then by doing this, the other optimization will start to work much better than before, and you get a, a, a real speed up. But yes, I don't know how to answer this question more precisely, basically. And if we don't have any other questions, I think we can thank our speaker once again.